everybody. Sorry we had a slight delay. We, um, we lost Angela Hartner, so sorry about that. But we found her, so we're absolutely thrilled that everybody's here. No. <laughs> Look, it is really fantastic to be here today, to be speaking to all of you for this event, which is in tribute to the late Joyce Molyneux. Um, I know there are lots of friends and family and colleagues here, um, people who knew her, people who uh, met her, had eaten at her restaurant, and then people who perhaps didn't know her. So one of the ambitions of today's um, event was to celebrate Joyce and to remember Joyce, but also to perhaps introduce Joyce to those of you who might not be so familiar with her today, and to reflect about her life with three amazing women chefs, because Joyce herself was, if not the first, one of the first women chefs to receive a Michelin star. She was universally revered and admired and loved. Um, and each of the women on the stage, all of us, have a different relationship with her, and that's part of what we wanted to talk about and explore. I just wanted to say, a little bit about my own relationship with her. I was taken to her restaurant when I was at university by my mum and my stepfather, and I can still remember this incredible light and this serenity that was in that restaurant, and her serenity, just seeing her cooking and eating this food that was so elegant and generous and beautiful, and it was special, but it was not in the least bit pretentious, and it just felt so welcoming to be there. And after that, I wrote to her, asked if I, when I finished university, if I could work in the kitchens, and she was very Joyce-like and said yes. And so I had this incredibly formative few months working there. And I honestly think that she, as with so many people, she shaped the direction of my life. Um, and I really don't think there would be a food season at the British Library if it weren't for that encounter with Joyce and her understanding of food, this way in which she invited people into the table and into thinking about food and being curious about food in a way that made pleasure, that made their sort of politics to pleasure. So for me, she's been really formative. And then when I went off, did all sorts of things, all sorts of things I did a PhD about British food history and as part of that, I interviewed Joyce Molyneux, uh, a life story recording which is archived at the British Library as a 10-hour recording made over a series of, of meetings with her in the early 2000s. Um, and that recording is available to anyone to come and listen to. And what we've done for today's event, and I've had all sorts of help from her family, from people who've worked with her, also from Joe Allen, the food season um, assistant, um, we've taken that big recording and we've taken some selections from it. So we have her voice, so we have Joyce here with us today. I'm going to play some of those and we'll listen to them and reflect on them as we go um, along. Um, uh, there she is in her, in her kitchen, uh, that lovely smile. Um, I wonder just quickly how many people, maybe just a hands up in the audience, knew Joyce and had met Joyce. Could we just do a hands up? So yeah, about, about half, I, I suppose, had met her. Um, the panel here have all been invited for different reasons, as I said. So Angela Hartnett's love of cooking was instilled in her, I believe, by her Italian grandmother and her mum. Uh, she's worked in and, in fact, run some of the UK's top restaurants. Um, and among other things, she opened the grill room at the Connaught with Gordon Ramsay. Um, and in 2008, she opened the acclaimed Murano and Mayfair restaurant. Um, she'll be familiar to all of you, I'm sure, from many appearances on television. And I think it's fair to say that you had a sort of, uh, your route into cooking or training has been sort of through a quite conventional, conventional traditional, sort of higher, you know, sort of, uh, formal uh, restaurants. Yeah, I suppose in the yeah. restaurant scene. But in the restaurant scene, yeah. that's what I... Yeah, but not necessarily in the way of going to college and no. all that sort of thing. But yeah, yeah but I'm you've sure. worked in some of yeah. those big male. Sort of male that's where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. I didn't want to. Thank you. That's what I right. right. Yeah, male. That's, that's you. Um, and I know we'll talk about how you knew Joyce and, and what encounters you had with her. Uh, Ravinda is a journalist, a chef, a restaurateur, was born in Kenya to Indian parents. Uh, her food is inspired by her mixed heritage and the UK's diverse immigrant culture. Uh, she made her first TV appearance when she won a competition yeah. of the search, uh, in search of the new Fanny Craddock, which was judged by Gordon Ramsay and our very own Angela Hartnett. <laughs> so Ravinda's here in part because of that. 
Um, she, I, I think it's right in saying you didn't have a conventional Not route into becoming a chef, a, a woman chef restaurateur, so we'll talk about that. Her recent book, Comfort and Joy, is completely fantastic. It's called Comfort and Joy, Irresistible Pleasures from a Vegetarian Kitchen. It's available and uh, in the bookshop and you'll be signing it later, which is wonderful. And then we have Jane Baxter, who started cooking while she was at Lee's University and then decided to take up as a career. She went to work for George Perry Smith, who is part of Joyce's story, which we'll find out about later. And then she followed by a stint at working at the Carved Angel in D Dartmouth with Joyce. Um, you worked at the River Cafe in London, she's written for The Guardian, but you regard Joyce as a real influence on yeah. your cooking and your life. Definitely. So we'll hear about that as well in a second. So I suppose the first question um, I wanted to ask, with, well, what I was planning to do was to weave questions with the panel in through also trying to uh, sort of follow the kind of chronology of, of Joyce's life. Um, and there'll be lots of opportunity as well to, for people in the audience to ask questions, but also to reflect on their own relationship with Joyce as well um, later on. Um, so, but before we get to sort of Joyce's life, I just wanted to know what you knew, knew of Joyce and what your relationship with her is, was, and why you wanted to take part. So I'd start with you, Angela. Um, mine was a bit like yours, in, actually. My mum took me to Joyce Molyneux, because my mum's an avid cookery reader um, and, and loves, you know, she's not so enthralled with modern day chefs, but more, and she always put, put Joyce along there with, um, uh, uh, Katie Stewart, you know, Elizabeth David, all that sort of female f cookery writing, even though Joyce was a restaurateur. And she would had was, when I was in my teens, she said, we've got to go and eat there, we've got to go and eat there. But my mum's never been able to drive, so it took until <laughs> I learned to drive. <laughs> and then I remember we got the train down to uh, Ashburton. Yeah, no, would it be, no, what's the... What's Totnes. No, it was, no, no it was something oh, really with A. What's the one beginning with that? Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> Relevant to the story. We got the train down. We stayed in a and b um, and we drove there. And that was the first time I had basil sorbet. And I was just, I, I couldn't, it blew my mind that, uh, that one, you made sorbet out of what I would consider a herb or a vegetable in a way, something savoury. And, and, you know, and you were in this incredible setting. And you see the image, the picture of Joyce on the carved angel is the image you have in your head of the white chef's jacket, the, the skirt, and then the head, you know, scarf around her head. And we had in, it was my mum, my sister and I, and I always remember it. And, you know, and, and then when I got to know Dartmouth a lot more, got to know like Jane and Mitch and stuff, and then Joyce, she was living at Bath at the time, would come down to the festivals yeah. and, and we'd see her there. But always been, you know, and just that, I think my biggest, um, apart from the fact she's an incredible cook and was ahead of her time in so many ways and never recognised for that maybe, and all these young kids now is foraging. She, she foraged before the word forage even existed, <laughs> yeah. you know. And I think that was what was amazing about her and the fact that she was so humble about everything. You, you would never have known yeah. how incredibly ahead of her time she was. Yeah, I think uh, I'm really glad you've said that because one of the one of the things I wanted to mention was that her um, niece uh, Sarah, who I believe is watching this is being live streamed, so welcome everybody who's watching um, online. Um, and hello, Sarah. Sarah and I were sort of writing back and forth, and she said to me, um, "I said as I'm doing this, you know." nervous about doing this, I feel, as a sort of weight of responsibility. And she said, um, Joyce was just so proud of the achievements of those she had worked with. And I thought, isn't that just Joyce? She wasn't proud of herself. Mm. She was proud of everybody else that she had worked with and yeah. just loved all these people that she'd influenced. And then Sarah said, I don't know what plans you have for the tone of the event, but I think that she'd want it to be more celebratory than mourning. Yeah. So I just thought that was exactly the spirit in which this has been done. And you're right, that kind of modesty and that... I, I always think of her as that having serenity yes. when you're around her and yeah. generosity. Uh, Ravinda. Uh, well, I came to her much, much later. I came to this country when I was seven, so I think I missed that whole... Whether she, well, I think she did television mm. and stuff. I didn't see her. And I actually really came across her when she was given an Observer Food Monthly Award and then I remember reading about her and being completely startled at the career that she had. And how we just didn't know that much about her and that seemed like wrong to me. But from what I read about her was this incredible maternal figure, generosity and um, a kind of progressiveness that was 
so beyond her years and what even happens now. And I've been just lucky enough to know some of the people who've come out of her kitchens and you can see her influence on them because it's that same mm -hmm. open heartedness and generosity that I think she inspired and instilled. Yeah, I think there's the most incredible sort of family tree of people who were influenced by and connected to Joyce and all the sort of offspring of, of Joyce. And you are definitely one of those people, Jane. So can you tell <laughs> us about how you met her? And, well, and I, your... I saw her on um, Take Six Cooks, I think when I was at uni. And I realised when I was at university that I wanted to, to cook and my parents were absolutely horrified. Um, <laughs> you know, first first child to go to uni. Anyway, I managed to get into work for George Perry Smith in, in um, Riverside in Helford. And while I was there, I went for an interview. My mum and dad came, picked me up, and took me for lunch. Like you were saying, you know, you went. For, we went for lunch before the interview. And yes, it was, you know, she gave people a chance who were really keen and didn't have that mm. training. And yeah. Yeah, she wasn't looking for a sort of formal training. No. What was it that she was looking for in her sort of team? And what, what do you think it was? I think it was enthusiasm. It was a love of food, people who were so interested in seasonal produce and who were also prepared to muck in because it was not a structured kitchen. You know, we did polished copper on Tuesdays. We all washed up putting the lids on the Christmas pudding, you know, it was, we had to do front of house, which I really didn't like. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Yeah, and then you, then you were in the kitchen, and the first day I rolled out cheese sablés and icing sugar. It was just, <laughs> <laughs> it was and, just and did she nasty. shout at you loudly no, and throw she, you out? No, no. I, I even when, I think there was a, a lad who came to work for us and he threw out a whole batch of fish soup. <laughs> <laughs> just threw it down the sink, <laughs> and she just no. no. I think the, the, when somebody dropped a, some dofu was potato, she did a little boxing kind of thing, <laughs> and that was about it. Was Aww. and it was just very jokey. But no, it was it was the most wonderful place to work. Mm. And and has gone on to you've carried on cooking and yeah, and it, it shaped the way yeah. you cook. Oh yeah, we still do a lot of her dishes on the, where I work in my business now, and yeah. It's, it's something that, you know, it's passed on also. You have to pass it on. Amazing. Yeah. So, so just sort of talking a bit about Joyce's life. She was born in, 19, in April 1931. Um, she was born in a suburb of um, Birmingham, and she described her family. She said it was a, in a working-class suburb of Birmingham. Um, in, uh, she described her family as working-class, um, but sort of educated working class. There's family members here, they can all correct me if I'm misinterpreting. Her father was the ass assistant chief chemist to scale makers, and she was one of three. She had an older brother called Ivan and a younger brother called Philip, who's here with us um, today. Which is, there he is. Yay! <laughs> Just brilliant. <laughs> Um, we're definitely going to talk about her, her path into the kitchen, but I, just a few kind of really formative moments. Um, so this is a, these are pictures of her with her two brothers, and then there are pictures, there's a photo of her mum and her dad, which Philip very kindly gave me. Um, she described <coughs> in her interview with me uh, how the children were all evacuated in 1939 until 1944 and how this was an incredibly formative experience for her as her, she described it as connecting to the countryside for the first time, trying fresh milk, herbs, vegetables grown in the garden and this kind of s sort of awakening to uh, seasons and food. Um, she then uh, was, did very, very well at school. She was extremely bright. Um, and I wanted to play um, an extract, one of the, fir the first extracts to play you from the interviews. This is her as a young girl. I want to play an extract of her describing a French exchange trip that she went on um, when she was still at school and how she experienced the food. So here she's. Because it was just, because after, was just the war, after the war, there was always the feeling that really you shouldn't com complain because, you know, it was better than it was during the war. The school I'd been to, the grammar school, had, um, had, had a relationship with a, with a school in France uh, in, a, in a, uh, a little town in Lorraine called Saint-Dié. 
And because I was quite good at French, I was, you know, asked if I'd like to go and everything like that. And I think the thing I remember most about that was that one day, the girl and I were going to go to, her, to relatives for lunch. And on the way there, they were telling me they'd got a special pudding for lunch. And it was made with, with eggs. They'd made au fa la neige. The same ingredients that we made an egg custard with, they would actually treat with reverence. You know, it just showed a different approach. It ate well, but very simply. And I remember us going out a couple of Sundays, sort of um, on, on, on a walk in the country, and they made up um, a sort of cooked vegetable salad of potatoes and beans and um, onion, a little bit of raw onion, and I think peas or, yes, something like that, and took some French dressing and just mixed that up. And that was absolutely delicious. And we had that with some bread. And it was a very good and very enjoyable. But, you know, it showed what they could do with something like that. And it really was lovely. So all the way through her interview, she's always remembering these moments when she has great pleasure um, in a very sort of simple way encountering um, food. And at the beginning of that clip, you, it, I should have set it up more clearly. What she was saying was that there was this attitude in sort of post-war Britain, where you shouldn't really sort of talk about food, you shouldn't really be uh, sort of full of desire for food, and it was very sort of plain and simple, and this moment in France was this sort of epiphany. And I wanted to ask uh, perhaps you, uh, Angela, to start off, just a, when you first started cooking, was there any sort of remnants of that attitude to, to, to cooking? Um, I suppose the similarities in the sense that uh, probably my grandmother was nearer to Joyce's age than, uh, yeah, maybe my, between my mum and her. But um, uh, the after, I always remember going in her fridge at home, and she, one, nev nothing was ever thrown out. Of course, you know, you, you, if you were a child of the war, or well, she wasn't a child; she was a young lady bringing up children during the war. Um, you didn't throw anything out, and you kept everything. You didn't use cling film; it was just a saucer on top of a bowl, you know. So, and it, and and I and I suppose that thing, everything was always my. Grandmother definitely believed in buying the best you could afford. It wasn't about buying lobster and caviar nonsense. It was all buying, you know, the best piece of meat that you could afford and not doing much with it, seasonality, and just checking everything, you know. I think that's the thing these days. We just throw stuff in baskets and not worry. But actually, I remember going with her to shops, and I'm sure Joyce was the similar, that you pick things up and you looked at it and you felt, was it ripe? Was it not? And, you know, the, and, and we just have lost that sort of touch with nature, I think, a bit. And I think probably after the war, you did appreciate food more, even though you weren't allowed to be spoiled. I think the fact that you had an egg, which was a normal egg, was probably a revelation. You can absolutely understand that when she went to France and she had that dessert, and suddenly it was delicious and you were allowed to be... Yeah, you know, and it's all the same ingredients yeah. as just an egg custard that is yeah. made with this kind of real reverence. Exactly. And, and I think we've all had those moments, you know. And, and I think if we're all honest, the simplest food is the one that stays in our mind. And it's still to this day, and it was in France as well, that one of the best meals I ever say was just roast chicken the next day with homemade mayonnaise and fresh mm. breads. And, you, and, and it was with friends and we broke the bread with our hands and you just tucked in and, that, and that's exactly as... Joyce described that dessert, really. Yeah. So you I'm want roast chicken, now, <laughs> <what> you say. <laughs> um, so she was very bright, very academically able, um, went to a grammar school, but she decided that she wanted to leave school at the age of 16 to go to catering college. Um, and in her interview, we talked about what the catering college, it was um, or domestic service college, it was Birmingham College for Domestic Science, and um, we talked about that and her decision and, and, and what, what her school thought about her leaving to go to catering college because there was an expect expectation that she should stay on and do languages because she was a, a bright young woman. So this is her describing that and then describing the training that she received. This course, you see, was really based, I suppose, just after the war, was it 47, 48, something like that, was really based on a pre-war curriculum. And I'm not quite sure even what this was designed for, because you actually were taught housekeeping, um, cleaning, um, washing, um, ironing, um, uh, two, two, two cookery classes a week, um, uh, dressmaking, 
uh, repairs. There was one class that was just repairs. <laughs> you know, I can do a fair darn. <laughs> the, the Birmingham Education Authority paid for it. And how old were you when you... I was 16 when I went there, and I went for two years and, and finished when I was 18. What, what did your school think about you going to... Oh, it, it was awful. I always remember the card I had from Miss Bamford that got my exam results on, you know, um, with me uh, distinctions and everything like that. What a great pity you're not returning to us. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, what did the, this kind of idea of the status of, of cookery and the expectation of women, girls going into cookery, how, what was that like for you, Jane, when you first started? Has that changed or...? I think, well, it, like I said before, my, my, my father was an industrial chemist. He was the son of a miner. And, you know, it, my mum was a stay-at-home mum, and she cooked. But it, was, it wasn't what you did. It was like going into service. Mm. That's how they saw it. And they were absolutely appalled, because I was the first person in our family to go to uni. And I did agriculture. But I used to take all of the samples and take them home and try and cook them, like <laughs> mango was. And, but, and, it, and it was the boys in the house who, who, I, who I was sharing with said, why don't you do what you love? And so that's what I did. But I just, I, I, I went to four different, I had four different jobs in Leeds and different establishments doing all sorts of stuff. And then, yeah, just wrote, got the good food guide and wrote to the top top restaurants, but seeing Joyce on Take Six Cooks, she, the, the fact that, they, that she took on amateurs, that she took on people who didn't, I didn't want to go to college again. I really didn't. But yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a lot different now. It is, it's accepted. But there are still male dominated kitchens that you really wouldn't want to go in. We'll come to that. <laughs> um, but I wanted to know when, at what point did your parents sort of come round to seeing, okay, this I, is a... I think when, when I went to work for George um, and I got in for his last season and they took me down um, and you know, I don't know if anybody's been to Helford Riverside, it's the most beautiful um, Helford village and they saw the staff accommodation which was a detached four bedroomed house with a summer house and a pond <laughs> and they sort of, sort of they didn't quite arrived. equate, they just didn't actually get what was going on but they realised that I wasn't going to so, into some horrible sort of dark basement, mm. you know. And, and then they met the other members of staff and they met George and, yeah, it gave them a bit of confidence. So we'll talk about George a little bit in a moment because, in fact, that, that house and that way of treating staff and of thinking about how you should live was very much part of his ethos, I understand, that then was also how Joyce ended up, you know, running her yeah. work businesses as well. So. Um, but uh, Ravinda, for you, because you had such a different route into it, yeah. you didn't start off not at all dreaming of. Did you dream of being a cook? Or no, how, what's the not status at all. in your, you know, family of, around I mean, becoming a cook? I grew sure. up in a very patriarchal household in Kenya, um, where my mother and every female relative joined this joined this cult of domesticity. So my mother's hopes and her parameters for me was that I would cook. I would do embroidery, crochet, knitting, um, ironing, and so should have gone to the Birmingham. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd have been I really relate to that, but um, you know that those are the parameters that were set for me. And my mother said to me early on, "You will cook for your husband and children, and I will teach you." And I remember being really huffy because growing up in Kenya, this beautiful outdoors, you know, life, being hoiked off my tricycle and dragged into the kitchen and being really angry because the boy cousins and my brother would all be playing outside and we were in the kitchen peeling potatoes, podding peas. But actually it was my grandfather who had this shamba allotment and he had come from, from India in the 1940s with nothing a real pioneer, this voyage in the dark, and fell in love with the soil because mm. it's so benevolent, so alluvial, volcanic soil that just produces the most gorgeous things. And he loved to eat, he loved to share produce, he had that generosity. And also as a Sikh, we have a tenant which is called Seva, which is basically community service. And he told me very early on that the the most, um, the easiest way of doing seva or community service is just to feed people. And I think that 
stayed in my heart. And then when I came to this country, it was like food became the connecting thing. While I felt so alienated growing up in this strange new climate that I wasn't used to, it was the kitchen that provided that sort of luxury and comfort and that connection for home with me. But again, I, I, I was the first girl in my family to go to university. My sisters were married off by the age of 19. Mm -hmm. And I was the rebellious one who was like, no, I'm going to do journalism, I'm going to work, I'm going to go to university. But throughout it, all I was interested in doing was being in the kitchen. And when, when it became apparent that you, you're going to go to university and be trained in you know, profession, but then actually you're going to veer into cooking professionally, how was that received initially? I mean... My father never got to see me in a kitchen and I think he, I had such a strained relationship with him because he was like, from when I was 16, he was like, right, go to secretarial college, do that, then you're going to get married and that's it. It's what my sisters had done. And um, it's only when I won that competition that suddenly, and he was, you know, an immigrant, he only understood business. So he's, he got on my back and he was like, okay, you can cook, you've got this sort of accolade now. I will rent you one of my my little um, horrible shops in Erith, <laughs> and you can turn that into a cafe. And you know he understood bricks mm. and mortar, and I think he developed this respect for what I was doing. And it's very sad because on the night of my first pop up was the night, and I was so exhilarated. And he'd been losing his, you know, he'd become very confused towards the end. And he used to call me sometimes three times a day being like, that event you were going to do, has it happened yet? What happened? How was it? So that night was like, right, I'll call him in the morning. I cleaned down the kitchen. It was 2 a.m. I got home. And it was the night he went into hospital and then eight weeks and he never came out. So he never got to see Jaconi. Mm. And oh. it's a good job because he would have just drunk me out of my whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Angela, your route, because what I want to do in a second is just describe Joyce's route sort of to the carved angel, but your yeah. route into professional cooking. You didn't go to catering college. Mm. You, you started how? Um, I started, I went off and did, uh, like Jane and um, Rav, we went off to college and did a history degree um, and then started working in local restaurants and bars and stuff and then worked abroad for a bit. And then I thought, OK, I, if I really want to do this, I should sort of try and work in a professional kitchen that, you know, one of the kitchens, I won't name it, we used to have B-52s at 11 o'clock in the morning oh and God. there was exchanges of, you know, club sandwiches going up in one lift and drinks coming down <laughs> in another, you know. <laughs> and then you sort of think, now you better get serious. Um, and I started working up in London, you know, and I did work for Gordon at the time. It was just on his trajectory up, you know, and he had the aubergine as his first restaurant and working there was brilliant. You know, yeah, it was a hard kitchen without doubt, the hours we did and all the rest of it. But it, um, it was a good time, to, I felt, to work with him and still do because he was in the kitchen every day. And I think if you're going to work for a, a chef, you want them, like you say, Joyce was there every day. You, yeah. know, you're, you know, that's what you want. So mm. it was great from that side. Well, that's a great sort of segue because um, it's, that's exactly the sort of training that, that Joyce had. So she... When she'd finished being at uh, college, she got a job initially at a canteen in an electroplating factory, so working in a canteen, and she wasn't very happy there. She described it browns, stews, and sponges, <laughs> and it was not clearly fulfilling her creative potential at all. And then just by chance, a friend of hers tipped her off about a job that was going in Stratford for a very a small restaurant, small French restaurant called the, the Mulberry Tree, uh, with the head chef that was called Donald Sutherland. Um, and she went for an interview there in 1950, 1951, and she got the job. And it was a small kitchen. It was just her and, um, not Donald, Douglas Sutherland, um, just her and this chef, Douglas, who was Mr. Sutherland, was very well classically trained uh, French chef who did the sort of classic English version of the French repertoire. And she worked with him until 1959, where she 
described in her interview um, as a th at that period of time, she tried asparagus for the first time. She tried hollandaise sauce for the first time. She saw puff pastry rice that she described being like, a, like magic. Uh, so this kind of encounters with really delicious food and also this very uh, sort of important training that set her up then for life. So she stayed there until 1959. And then there was a change in, um, uh, a ch a change in ownership of the restaurant at the Mulberry Tree. And um, she applied for, she read in the Lady Magazine about an advert, uh, she read an advert in the Lady Magazine for a job that was going at the Hole in the Wall in Bath, which was run by or owned by a man called George Perry Smith. And perhaps, Jane, can you just say a few words for people who don't know about George Perry Smith? What, what was he like um, or how, what was his influence, I suppose? I think, I think it was the way he ran his business. Um, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to do his last season down in Cornwall. Um, and it wasn't like any other place. It really wasn't. I mean, they had rooms, so he had to do the, clean the rooms as well. And his partner, Heather, would be with a... She, she, um, she had a walking stick and she'd, she'd move the bed and check under the bed. <laughs> um, we, we washed up. We did, like, it was just like the way Joyce ran her kitchen. I so this flat structure yeah, where, was you this structure cooked, where you did the you wait, cooked, front of house. You yeah, front of house. You hand wrote the menus every evening, lay the fire. Um, it was the most beautiful place and the food was just incredible. And it was, it was that generosity that Joyce sort of had. You know, they'd wheel out a whole... If they were having leg of lamb with pepper and arter, they'd wheel out a whole leg of lamb and start carving it. Um, like Joyce ha did with, you know, with the puddings when she'd take a whole steam marmalade ro roll to the table and that terrine of fish soup that you, that you had, you know, with a bowl. You didn't get a bowl, you got a terrine. Yeah. And, and I'm right in saying, so um, Mr. Sutherland was a very sort of, I think, a very trained, she spoke very fondly of him, but he was quite so sort of old-fashioned, quite hierarchical, um, and trained in some sort of old-fashioned way. But George Perry Smith was a bohemian, wasn't yeah. he? He was a sort of, he was inspired by Elizabeth David and, and a sort of counterculture, much more relaxed and loose as yeah. a person. I think that encounter with him was really... Uh, sort of transformative for Joyce. I'm going to play now a clip of her describing going for the interview and then, and then being at the, at the hole in the wall in Bath. I'd always liked the idea of Bath and I'd come down for a week's holiday once, once, one September. It might have been the good food guy that I'd seen, Mr. Perry Smith's restaurant, and we had lunch at, at, at the hole in the wall. I, I thought it was marvellous and I thought the idea of the cold table there looked terrific as well. It always looked lovely. It, it always looked, it wasn't overdressed. Nothing was glazed or in aspic. Often people would come in lunchtime and perhaps might have just, just a, 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 an hors d'oeuvre, a sort of ra rather large hors d'oeuvre if they'd got a short time. Or uh, perhaps people would just come in and have an omelette. I think this was a nice thing, um, that it, it was made people feel relaxed. They didn't feel that they were constrained into having a three course meal. And do you remember going, for, did you go for an interview with George Yes, Harrison? I did. And, uh, and uh, this is, just shows you how different it was. You were given a meal in the restaurant first to show you what the place was like and what the food was like. And it was such a compliment being asked to have a meal, you know, instead of, you know, coming in the back, back door, you know, and being interviewed perhaps in the chef's office. I was, I was delighted, but actually uh, it was general assistant, so it's going to have to be some waiting as well, and I was terrified of the thought of that. That was, that was quite extraordinary, quite extraordinary. And this is another thing he did, that, that people did actually do some of one and some of the other. You did, you did a bit in the kitchen and, and a bit in, uh, and a bit in, the, in the restaurant. And each side um, in, informed the other. So, Angela, you've worked in notoriously, you alluded to it before, these kind of very hierarchical, <coughs> male-dominated restaurants. I mean, is there a place for that? What, is, now? Now? Is it necessary? What's, you know, because what Joyce describes there and then what the, the car, how the mm. car Angel was run was so different from that and yet produced beautiful food. Yeah. Can you... I mean, I would say there's no place for... Uh, crazy aggression in kitchens anymore that's rather than necessarily male because I think 
ultimately we still are probably this many blokes to this many women, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so you are going to get kitchens that have more men than women. Um, but I would say you don't need to, there's no reason in any industry to treat your team or your, you know, your members of staff badly. I think that's... And, I, and it sounds like from what Joyce did and what George Perry Smith did, they, again, ahead of their time in a way. You know, we have guys and girls come and what we call stages these days where they might come and spend two or three days with you. And we always say, you know, we always give them a dinner. We do it afterwards. We say, go and eat, come back the next day and come and have dinner on us, you know. So, you know, if it's mm -hmm. a thank you, you've come and worked for us, you've seen something, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I think there are, we have all that culture as well. But I think probably... And it's interesting sort of referring to you, Jane, when you said about your parents. Not so much London, but I refer to Luke, who runs our, the hotel we do in Limewood. And he takes a, a lot of young children, as in like 17, 18-year-olds, children that have just come out of college. And the thing Luke's done, which I think has been transformational, is he has straight away got to know the parents. Because I think, and that's it. So the parents come and eat with mum, you know, mum and dad, yeah. with whoever's coming. So they know Luke's their contacts. And I think that has made such a difference because, unfortunately, because of all the silly nonsense we have had on TV and the screaming, lots of parents look and go, why the hell do you want to be a chef? Oh, my God. Even my mum said it to me when I was working and going, oh, my God, mum, I hate it, I hate it. She goes, why are you doing this, Angela? <laughs> to do you, you know? And so, you know, but if you meet who your employer yeah. is or employee, employer, yeah, then, of course, you're going to be, you know, mellowed and mm. more relaxed and feel there's a point of contact. So... As, you know, Joyce and, you know, they did it ahead. Again, they were sort of, you know, ahead of their time, I think. And, and what about this, everybody doing a bit of everything? What do you think about that, the front I mean, of house? I mean, I love that idea. Mm. Trying to get it these days, I think, is hard. Yeah, I think um, it is tough, you know, because of, I don't know, I don't know, 101 reasons, I think. But I think... Um, the idea, I think, is a beautiful idea. I do love that because, I mean, if I'm honest, when you were talking about that, because I always say, oh, I just want to go and run a little place by the seaside. And I, in, my, in my head, it just came to me, <laughs> Neil in the kitchen, me writing the menu. Both <laughs> <laughs> but it, to me, that is idyllic. And I think that's how, yeah. you know, it's not utopia. It's just normal. And I think Mitch probably does it quite well. Mitch yeah. Tonks, those of mm -hmm. you know in Dartmouth. You know, he's got his son in the kitchen. Bronte's his girlfriend, the fiancé front of house. And I think there probably is a little bit. You see Mitch cooking the next day, serving the table. I think that's a great way of doing it, you know, and I think it should be like that. Well, and for, for you, Ravinda, because you didn't come through a sort of traditional training, how's that influenced how you run your kitchen? Well, I've done a lot of learning on the job. I think that <laughs> first year was such a shock for me, um, such a baptism of fire. But I think, you know, and I grew up with a mother who was like, um, you know, all gnashing teeth and terrifying with a rolling pin in her hand. <laughs> and I, that's, I knew that's not how I want to, you know, run my kitchen. And I think for us, it's always been this, you know, it's very inspired by Danny Meyer and this idea of if you can't show hospitality to your team mm. first, you haven't got a hope in, in hell of showing it to anybody else. So, and it, it's lovely because with our kitchen, we don't have a structure as, as your pastry or this, your that. Everyone does a bit mm. of everything. Um, as we are so short-staffed at the moment as well, you know, all, you know, <laughs> restaurants, we've had times where the kitchen are running and, you know, taking yeah. food up to, 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 the, to the guests. But I think it's this idea of an open kitchen. We never, ever wanted any walls between. Mm. There are no yeah. doors. You come yeah. downstairs to the kitchen, you see everyone. And I think that interplay between the guest mm. and the person who's cooking the food for you is so important mm. and it encourages that conversation and excitement. And I, that's what we've tried to do. And I, it's a really lovely thing. Amazing. I mean, she was so ahead of her time, mm. wasn't she? As yeah. was George Perry Smith. Yes. Um, so she stayed at the Hole in the Wall until um, 1974. And then George Perry Smith and his wife, Heather, um, sold the hole in the wall and they were moving to Devon they initially to buy one restaurant but they ended up buying two one being the one that you ended up you, in you started in yeah. yeah and then the other being the carved angel on Dartmouth this beautiful site looking out over the harbour and that's where Joyce went in 1974 um, as the head uh, to, to run that restaurant with um, George Perry Smith's I think step nephew uh, Tom Jane who's also helped me some of this together as well and he was front of, front of house 
Um, and she's, she's opened that restaurant in 1974. And in this next extract, she talks about um, how the restaurant was first viewed, but then also what they were doing. So what was her approach and what was the food? So we, we're getting to the carved danger of food here. That, that is a, sorry, that's photos from her cookery book of three of her dishes, and here's her talking about the carved angel. We, we probably were ahead of the town's taste. It was early days, yes. So slightly, more, slightly more spicy, um, uh, slightly more spicy, uh, slightly more um, sort of uh, Middle Eastern, um, uh, a, a little bit more marinated and, and grilled, and things like that, um, uh, and and perhaps a, a little bits and pieces I brought back from Spain, and more herbs as well. What, what sort of books are you reading, or you know, cookery writers were influenced on I know, at the I've, time? Well, I think a, a lot of Jane Grigson, because Jane Grigson was at the same time as Elizabeth David, but following on very much, and then uh, going on, on to a little bit of Ken Hom. Did you ever use Claudia Rodan's? Yes, yes, her Middle Eastern book was, was lovely. We always used to look forward each year to the first salmon from uh, Out of the Dart, and that was, that was lovely, really was, was magic. And I used to think, well, that, because that is the very first one, we'll just have it absolutely plain, just with some hollandaise. The excitement of the thing was the change of the seasons and things coming along. The treat of actually really having um, the first fresh grouse, and then somebody will go down Slapton Lee and shoot wild duck. And then later on, there'll be some pheasants and those things through the winter. There were small changes, but uh, the, the, it was almost the turn of the year and, and different things coming along. Does that, do, does that yeah. sort of remind you of, of the <laughs> yes, way that of she cooked? I can see you yeah. smiling there. Yeah. Can, you, can you sort of try and I explain for you what was so special about it? Was, it was this, this relationship with the suppliers and, and the seasons. I mean, it, you know, the, she talked about the salmon and there's this massive guy called Robert Dart who fished on the dart, one of the only <laughs> people who fished on the dart and he'd sort of come in and Joyce was so sort of small and the, the, these big fishermen used to come in and sort of ask her questions. I remember one bringing in a squat lobster, they didn't know what it was. Um, kids would come in with their muscle, muscles that they'd got. Um, we, were off, we were often sent out to pick samphire. Um, yeah, it was... It was the relationship with suppliers, the guy who made the goat's cheese that she marinated. You know, they, they were the first ingredients and then everything else came. And for you, Ravinda, was there, in, in what Joyce just said, what, what resonated for you in that around your approach to food? I mean, I'm just like really startled at that time that she was thinking about Middle Eastern flavors and getting things from Spain and, and, and seeing that, you know, because I'd always thought her food would, would be very, very British with this sort of French influence. But, you know, she was reading Claudia Rodin and, and, and getting that, you know, all those influences, I think, amazing. And, and doing it in a town, it's a town, I suppose, yeah. town, you know, where it, I think that food, the way she described it, was really surprising at first. And it took a long, she described lots of winters where there were very empty restaurants, there, yeah. the <laughs> restaurant, dining room, nobody coming. And it took a few years. And I think it was the appearance on television and then slowly, you know, and she got the Michelin star in 1978, probably the, maybe the first woman, but one of the first women. Um, just quickly, I wanted to go to Gerard, who's in the audience somewhere. Oh, here. So Gerard's in the audience, and he has some menus from uh, The Carved Angel. And yeah. I just wondered if, Gerard, would you just read them out and read one or two out, or yeah, one out, you. and <coughs> tell us... Well, tell this is from... Yeah. When I first started in uh, 85, when I was 16, I left school, having been offered a job at Rue, which I couldn't afford to live in London, so I went to John's, which was not too far, I think. Um, and very hands-on. So this is February 1987. Uh, from top fish soup, uh, of course, um, a split pea and bacon soup. A fishy hors d'oeuvre of sturgeon, brochette, a smoked eel, grilled pilchard, and lobster par parsley pate. And then something that did appear on staff... Um, Staff lunch was the galantine of boar's head with spiced fruit. Which that didn't sound <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but even then, we've got um, uh, some of her favourite things: um, ox tongue with pecan cream sauce and beetroot. Um, yeah. So that's February. And then Christmas '87. This was the year I was there as well. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we've gone to uh, a civet of hair with spiced apple jelly. And mm. one of her letters I've got here, she writes, um, Last autumn I didn't feel my hands were strong enough to skin a hair, so I bought one that had been gutted already. And it didn't take me long to divide it into bowls and set it all out neatly. Um, and whenever we stayed with each other, we always had that hair baked in cream, which was her favourite thing. Herb baked in cream. Hair. hair baked in cream. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, Gerald. No really appreciate that. Um, Angela, can you just reflect uh, in, to what extent or in ways in which you think that Joyce shaped food, has shaped food culture here? Um, I think we've, we've touched upon it. I think the, sim the seasonality and simplicity. I know everyone um, talks about that a lot, but I don't know if everyone actually follows it to the hilts. And actually... I think the, what was extraordinary about what you just said, Jared, is that, that she skins hairs. Mm, or yeah. sk you know, I, I would beg to differ how many young chefs these days or young cooks could if someone turned up at the back door and said, here, I've got a brace of hair for you, would they be able to do anything with it? Never mind cook with it, would they be able to deal with it? So I think that's, that's the other, you know, her actual skill in her hands, never mind her palate, that she was able to take animals and, and fish and fill it, everything down. We're, and I think we're in danger of losing a lot of those yeah. skills. I, I, you know, as I said, the basil sorbet, making that without a packo jet. You know, every kitchen's got that now and they can do it. But back when we went, which was probably, I'm trying to think, mid eight, uh, late 80s or mid 80s, you know, she, that wouldn't have existed. And all those things. So I think, you know, and, and as Ravinda said, you know, so many people don't realise who Joyce is or who Joyce was, rather, excuse me, and her influence. And I think more than ever, she set the tone, and it, and it should be recognised, really. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really conscious of time, but what I wanted to do... So she's... I, well, let me just say, she stayed at the Carved Angels. She never really left the Carved Angels. She's, in 1999, I think, she moved to Bath, but she would go back um, and, and visit regularly and, and cook, I believe, on occasion. Um, so she was always connected to uh, the Carved Angel and, and all her friends would go and visit her in Bath. And um, I went to do my interviews with her in Bath for this oral history. And I cannot tell you the sandwiches I used to leave with for my train journey were just like yeah. unbelievable. Um, so, I, yeah, it was, I strung that interview out, I tell you. Um, <laughs> but what I also <laughs> wanted to, to talk about was a, a little bit about her personal life. She didn't have... Um, children, but she described in the interview all the people that she'd worked with, all the young people that she'd worked with, as being like her children, and also talked about her beloved nieces and nephews. Um, but she met in at her time at the Mulberry Tree um, a waiter called Stephen Rodriguez Garcia, who was from Barcelona, um, and she was devoted to him and he to her as well throughout their lives, her partner Stephen. And I just wanted to play this clip, which... Um, really makes me laugh and also just I think brings Joyce to life as a as a funny person and a and a and a real woman. So here. And they said they knew of um, a couple of Spanish waiters up there that um, they thought wanted jobs and it came down and one was Stephen, the man I, I who's my partner afterwards. And that's how I met him in the first place. Typical Catalan. Just, I think it was his energy. Yes. It's sort of like a, uh, like a curled spring. You didn't talk about sexual attributes. Well, people talked about women's breasts and things like that, but you didn't talk about men's bottoms. Right? No, at all. But I do remember, <laughs> got a super bottom. I think at that age, when you see handsome men, you also assume you're the only one who thinks they're handsome, whereas actually the whole world does. And I was quite self-sufficient as well. I was quite used to being by myself. And so how did your romance with Stephen start? In a, in a, in a very teasing way, as they often are, you know. Sort of flirting and yes, teasing each right. other. Yes, that's right, that's right. But I did, find him, I did find him very attractive. He did enjoy his food immensely. And um, yes, and, and, and just loved almost anything. He used to bring back things from, back from Spain when he'd been on holiday. Um, you know, so he'd bring squid back and uh, sometimes wild mushrooms and all sorts of things. <laughs> um, 
So I'm going to, in a second, draw, draw this uh, to a close, but then open out to the audience to have reflections that people have or memories of, of Joyce and also, of course, questions. But before I do, just a question for, for each of you. Um, what would you cook for Joyce Ravinda if she were to come to Jaconi? What would you want to wow. give her? <clears throat> she loved uh, the sea, right? So I think um, one of the dishes we've had on the menu that's always been very popular is a, a skate, a whole skate wing, uh, just really simply pan fried with a lime pickle bernoisette. So we make the lime pickle mm. and then we make a bernoisette out of it. And then just some, um, we make some uh, samphire bhajis that go with it. Just really simple dish, but kind of classic, but with a little jaconi mm. twist. I, I know she would have loved that, but she also would have loved Jaconi. I think had such a beautiful oh, restaurant and so sort of elegant and beautiful fabric. She was really aesthetic person, wasn't she? She loved sensuous, beautiful things visually and sort of viscerally as well. I'm gutted I never got to eat her food. Yeah, <laughs> you have to get the book, which you can just sometimes yeah. score off eBay if you're lucky. Mm. That is a brilliant book. Um, and Jane, for you, what recipe most reminds you of Joyce? Do you know what the first thing that came to mind is, um, we were talking about simplicity and, and what's influenced you, and I think it would have to be um, the Puli and Chickpea Pasta Chechia Tria, because it's so simple. Can you describe it? It is a mix, it's a semolina-based pasta, um, quite, quite thick. It's all in the cooking of the chickpeas and getting the flavour into into the, the sort of liquid and juice around the chickpeas and then deep frying a third of the pasta, which is, makes it quite crunchy and lots of olive oil. And it was one of those things, you know, when you say you eat something and it's like, how does this taste so wonderful with the simplest ingredients? So I'd want to do that for Joyce. Brilliant. Thank you. And I know that you have cooked for Joyce, haven't you? Because mm. um, she came to Murano and, um, and I, I wonder, could you perhaps describe what you would want to cook for her now? Oh, God. I think, I think probably now I'd say we'd just sit in the garden and have a roast chicken or something, really. <laughs> no, but, you know, something that simple, you know, just a really the best chicken we could get. Uh, great bread and mayonnaise, you know, that sort of thing. But, yeah, I, I think that's... I think she enjoyed simplicity, but, you know, but as, as we all said, that I love the idea that she had that real influence of the Middle East and southern yeah. Italy and northern Spain, you know, and again, you know, we've said it and I've said it, you know, way ahead of before yeah. anyone would have thought and you would never have thought that when you, if you saw Joyce. I, I, you're absolutely right, and I so I love this book to be reissued and I really hope that this event, but also, you know, this event and ongoing that she's talked about and remembered and revered as she deserves to be. Mm. Um, I've got one more clip to play, but I'm going to play it right at the very end, I think. So for the moment, I'm going to swing around here and see if there are any questions from the audience or any um, memories or, yeah, uh, Jenny, I think we're going to have, we will have roving mics, I think. Hmm. Perhaps we won't, <laughs> so speak loudly, Jen. <laughs> Jen, yeah. As you said, so pioneering. I was wondering, did people understand it? Because you know, she was very modest, wasn't she? Mm. Yeah. Did other chefs see what she did and, and learn from that? I just wonder if you knew that and you know, can you see her influence? Because she was, it's so great you're doing this, because she totally reserves her, her moment in the limelight. Mm. But I sort of feel she often never got it really. Mm. Um, speaking to you, we all I, I I'm going to defer to the chefs, but it seems to me that in a way she was like a chef's chef, if that makes sense. I don't, maybe, n not a kind of broader public. I don't know. Go, go ahead. I mean, I would say, I, I would argue that you've probably got half a dozen people here today mm. who are on this speaking, let's say Fergus, who's coming this afternoon, yeah. Margot, Jeremy Lee, I would say all of them yeah. would Sean say Hill. Joyce, Sean yeah. Hill. Sean I, mean, I, I think it sounds awful to say that generation. <laughs> <laughs> dare I say it. Um, but that generation have influenced a... Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's, it's a legacy, isn't it, that goes mm. on? Yeah, Jane. Because there was Stephen Markwick in, in Bristol who was still cooking a lot of Joyce's food, and he's retired. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think you are right. It, it's a certain type of chef-chef. I mean, even in, even in South Devon, I, I mention her name, and people, they don't 
you know, 20 miles down the road. They've never heard of her. Should be a plaque outside the yeah. should be, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah, blue, that's a thing. There we are, that's started here. <laughs> but what about, um, what about also her influence on suppliers? I mean, she was certainly ahead of the game, as you've described, yeah. you know, buying locally, sourcing locally, having that relationship. I mean, now in the southeast, there's amazing suppliers. Was she part of that? I know that I'm not going to... He doesn't want me to mention him because there's someone here who's, a, who's ended up becoming a cheesemaker and worked with Joyce, and... Um, but I'm sure there were... Oh, there's... Oh, <laughs> ben! Ben, chicken more cheese, amazing. And yeah, she, she was part... Influenced you, didn't she? And, and Yeah. Having a cheese trolley, beanie blue, that I used to serve in a restaurant, which I still make now. Amazing. And I'm sure there are others as well. Yeah, well, Mark Lobb, uh, he was one of our suppliers. He's still in Kingsbridge Market every other Saturday. And, um, yeah, there are people around. But there, were, there was a butcher's in um, Totnes. I think that's closed now. I can't... And I don't know if there's any salmon left in the dart. Mm. Gerard, you might know. Yeah, I, I know. I, I don't think there are. I don't think there are, so... Mm. I'm sure Robert's still out there. Yeah, I'm sure he is. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions or comments? Yeah, it's hi. It's a question for Angela, really. I'm just wondering um, if you remember what Joyce ate when she came to Murano at that time, and how did you feel about cooking for her? Um, I've, well, I felt very privileged. I think it was Rosie that I badgered to sort it out. Rosie, Rosie Sykes. Rosie yeah. Sykes, who worked for Joyce as well. And I've known through mutual friends, and I said, "You still know Joyce?" Blah blah blah. And 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 then she came with Polly. You know, all three of them came. I honestly, I, I can't remember. Definitely slid into that. I tell you, yeah, it was great. <laughs> <day. laughs> really embarrassing, but yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, and, was amazing. and she really wanted. Yeah, go ahead. I was no, there. and it was just, and it was, you know, and I sort of did another thing recently, a couple, I think two years ago, I met Delia for the first time, and to me, it's like meeting your heroines, you know, it really is something, and, and but they're both, you know, of that, the humility of Joyce was, she couldn't quite understand how I thought it was so incredible that we, I met her, and then we cooked for her, or Neil cooked for her at the, at the dark, uh, dark marina, that's something totally different, <laughs> um, at the seahorse. He and Joyce came to eat, so it, it, you know, it was a real privilege, actually, you know. And I, I still, to this day, think, you know, it's like a handful of chefs. So you think, actually, I'm so glad you met them or to cook for them. Yeah, I remember after that lunch, she really wanted to go to see Lila's shop, yeah, the grocery shop, and mm. um, it was quite a trek. And she was definitely elderly then, mm. or old then, you know. So, mm. I, yeah, in her late eighties, I would have thought. And um, we made, but then we got there. It's just she just came alive, like touching all this food and talking mm. to the producers and just mm. having the most amazing, you know, conversations with people. She just yeah. loved it. It just sort of it was where she got her energy from. It was incredible. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments, Gerard? I know the guy at the back. Though. Oh, the guy at the back, and then Philip, and then Gerard. I'm going to come back. Let's see. Hello. Hi. I'm I'm Ravinda's husband. So. Oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I know this is something that we talk about at the restaurant, um, and since we have three, you know, wonderful female chefs and one behind you on the board there, do do female chefs cook differently than male chefs? Ooh. Ooh. What 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 are we What's what are we answer? missing? Well, my answer is yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you, mean, yeah. Do you I, argue with him about this? Sorry. Well, <laughs> no. I think that for me, I don't know. I can't say I cook differently because I can't get into the head of a male chef. But for me, I think my greatest influence has been maternal cookery. That wisdom of the women who cooked around me in in the home who never got, like Joyce, that, that moment in the spotlight. I feel, um, you know, I'm standing on their shoulders. It's because of them. I'm mm. here because of them. Mm. And uh, so I think we cook like cooks, a very honest yeah. approach to cooking. Mm. It's not about any, you know, glitz and glamour. Or whatever. It's just sort of we cook to nourish and nurture. That's yeah. kind of how we do it. And to, to make people feel loved, it's a very intuitive way of cooking as well. Common sense. I think sometimes Mac, men hack that. I can say that about my husband because if he gets into the kitchen, oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think yeah. that's it. What yeah. do you think? You I agree with everything you just said. That's do brilliant. You? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I think 
you've nailed it. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, when I, the first time I was on Saturday Kitchen, I got into trouble, and there was I think there was quite a few complaints because I said that men can't make puddings. <laughs> they make desserts. <laughs> and it was kind of a jokey thing, but I, yeah, I got into trouble. But, that, the, but I do actually believe that. But that's, that's what I, when I say my mum loved people like Katie Stewart, Delia, everyone, you know, Joyce. And, but she always said when she watched new chefs come, she goes, but Angela, can they make a cake? <laughs> <laughs> and that was her obsession. That all these chefs would do this. She goes, but can they make a make like it? And drizzle yeah. and actually, you could argue probably a lot of them can't. Oh, they can flumbe a string, but they can't make a cake. Amazing. Yeah. Um, Philip, Joyce's brother here. Do you want to, can you just wait for a, um, can we just wait for the microphone, yeah. Philip? Thank you, it's just coming. Thank you. This is really um, my wife's story, than my own. We were up at a, a conference uh, further up in Devon, and there were um, delegates there from all over the world, but from the United States. Um, the men were doing their thing, of course, serious thing. The wives were in the lounge doing wives' things. <laughs> and one of them um, buttonholed my wife and uh, had a list of things which she had to do. And one of these, um, Castle Drogo. You know Castle Drogo? Yeah. And uh, my wife said, yes, we've got a car, we can take you there. Okay, the second thing, Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth, um, there was a restaurant down there, Carved Angel, yes, yes, my wife said, we can take you there, it's run by my sister-in-law, <laughs> <laughs> we can take you there, and we did. Thank you very much. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Um, Gerard, did you have something, you said that you had yeah. a letter you wanted to Sorry. read? Yeah, a few things. Um, yeah, I can, yeah, which actually references Angela. Gerard, can you just, in case people missed it, what was your relationship with the Carved Angel? Just You started oh, I, working there at 16? Went there at 16 up, and then on and off until 97, so about 10, 10 11 years. But stayed in touch with Joyce. Um, we shared a love of gardening and game, and uh, so we would swap recipes and I'd go and cook for her and she'd come and cook for us at home. But um, there's a lovely piece here, she's talking... This is from uh, 2014. Uh, for something completely different, next Friday, the Observer is sending a photographer to Bath, um, to Bath rather, with 20-year-old George from Murano Restaurant in London <laughs> uh, for a photograph uh, for the front cover of the Observer Food magazine. George is a 20-year-old woman working for Angela Hartnett. The restaurant is ma in Mayfair and rated seven in the Good Food Guide. Uh -huh. So I look forward to hearing her story and eating there at some point. Oh, that's so yeah, lovely. I remember that, yeah. That's so lovely. Thanks, Gerard. Um, are there any more questions or um, comments or any other memories and reflections of Joyce at this point? Itamar, are there any... You're trying to work the iPad. These are the online ones. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Itamar. You haven't been looking, have you? Uh, Okay. I, I, I have kind of like a big question, maybe controversial. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh no. go on. Um, Puddings. But just, just kind of like about um, male and female chefs and uh, the place of, of family and the choice of raising a family and having kids. You know, Joyce, uh, I don't know if she, she chose or not, but there, it is a big question, I think, mm. for women, you know, I think especially in, in kitchens. I don't know, it's a little bit explosive. No, so. I, no you know, it was on my list, and I, I, it's, yeah. you've, you've gone there, and so I think it's a yeah. great question. And, um, yeah, I'm not uh, sure what the question is. No, no, I, <laughs> about, no, no, I think about fa the question about family life, and I think definitely when you listen to Joyce's um, recording, the way she describes, you know, she, she, just, she talks about not having children, and it's not said with great regret. I think that was, it seemed like a, cho a very active choice for her and she absolutely loved all the sort of young people that she nurtured. Um, who knows? But I, it's interesting for, for you in terms of juggling family life, relationships and being chef. You are... I was, yeah, well, I, I, I brought, brought a, a, um, a, a six-month-year-old baby back from Samoa um, and 
started to work when he was about a year old, and that's when I started at the field kitchen. And, you know, we all have choices to make, and I think the choices I had to make was how long I was going to work, and I was lucky that I was able to do mornings initially, and then when the field kitchen opened, daytimes, and I managed just. Yeah. <laughs> He's not in prison. He's 20. <laughs> well <done. laughs> He's a lovely yeah. lad. <laughs> he is a lovely lad. Um, he's 20 now, and I dragged him all over. I've dragged him all over Italy and all over the world, and he was quite resentful at 16 and a bit of a handful. But you know, I think you make your choices, and it's you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be without him. But it was, it was hard. For sure. It was really hard. And, and it's not just children, though, is yeah. it? It's actually just having relationships yeah. is difficult around the hours and the, the sort yeah. of stress of it as well. I mean, do, would you like to add anything? or? or <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I do. I, I think, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, why not? Uh, I think women still do more than men in the house. Sorry, I do. I genuinely, I, I certainly feel I do. And I still have a full-time job. My husband has a full-time job, but I'm the one who makes sure the bins goes out. You do, yeah. you know. And I don't think that has changed in all of, you know. And I think women probably deal with more of the childcare, whether they're working full-time or not. So, it, so I think Jane's right. You can, you can do it all. Of course you do, but you do put a lot of pressure on yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's the same for me. I mean, I came to a restaurant much later in life, so. It was so all-consuming. We got married and opened the restaurant at exactly the same time. So, you know, it was a choice of, well, this is a time to put everything into the restaurant. But I think there are so many different ways to be a mother. I mm. mean, I have yeah. amazing nieces and nephews. Uh, you know, yeah. the team are like my children, sometimes very naughty children. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's such a privilege for me because we are like a family. And, you know, two of our, like our front of house, um, rest general manager, restaurant manager, have been with me for seven years now. Mm. And it's such a great privilege because I've seen them grow up and in a way it's like being their mum and, you mm. know, so yeah. When I think in that sense, in a, you, you could say that jo Joyce was also a pioneer in the way that she chose to be a woman at mm. that time from that generation, not just being uh, an amazing, critically acclaimed chef, but maybe in order to do that but she made some choices that also meant that she led a you know an independent life ran a business had a relationship with Stephen that was a devoted relationship you know she she sort of set her own terms in that way in that very unassuming quiet modest way that she had she was tr truly remarkable I just anyone have any other questions uh, that oh we have got two there's one here and then one at the back and I was just wondering if you could expand, uh, well, if you could give your view of how you felt, how you feel Joyce would view our modern disconnect between health, diet, and landscape. Oh. Oh. Come on, Jane. <laughs> don't, look, don't look at me. Come on, Jane. Jane, you've been thrown into that. No, that's not fair. <laughs> well, how, I mean, I think... How do you feel about it? Because you're not... You, you have I think to share she would a be very frustrated, ethos. to be honest. That, that, that there are problems, we're, we're bringing up, we, you know, even though it was an awful thing to happen to be a child that was relocated from your family and go to the countryside during the war, what she experienced, and I remember my nephews who were both New York kids, and when they came over here, you know, and they, they, they eat well and all the rest of it, but we went to my uncle's allotment in Dulwich and we picked potatoes and they were like, oh my God, a potato, you know, and we're losing that a bit, yeah, well not yeah, a bit, yeah. we are. And now I think Joyce would be very um, frustrated and upset, probably. I think she'd be really, you know, uh, you know, just it, it feels so wrong that you cook great food and you don't know where it comes from. And yet so many people go to a restaurant and eat great food. But do they realise, you know, where that has come from? And my husband's always the one who does it in the restaurant. And I do it. We all do it. You know, if I see something thrown away and I go, do you know how long that farmer Expletive, yeah. expletive, <laughs> took to grow that asparagus and you've just tossed, you know, and I think people don't appreciate that. Yeah. For us, we feel really strongly that there is this invisible humanity at your table every time you sit down to eat and that's what we try and tell our team, that this has taken someone to plant that seed, someone to, you know, yeah. look after it, water it, nurture it, pick it, even the person who's driven it from, you know, the farm to cargo to come to you. And particularly when you're getting things from abroad, and I've seen it firsthand, 
you know, they keep the seconds for themselves and they're giving us the best of what they mm -hmm. have. And it's just criminal to waste. And I think that reverence that Joyce had for produce for, yeah. you know, is, is missing now. And I think for me, that came from my grandfather because he'd come from such scarcity. He literally saw the miracle, especially in his mm. allotment. He would be like, God, this onion, the fact that, you know, it's, it comes to the kitchen, it's faced pests, blight, bad weather, and yet it turns up in our kitchen. We can cook a meal with it, share what we cook. That is a miracle. And we're so yeah. far removed from those small pleasures. Yeah. Mm. It's the waste today. Mm. Yeah. I think that is the biggest tragedy, really. Um, you know, my my mum was, you know, Sun Sunderland, working class, and yeah, the, nothing was wasted, mm -hmm. and and you know, it carried through with Joyce, such good housekeeping. You know, I have to say, a few of the staff meals were a little bit dodgy. <laughs> 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 I remember looking at Nick Coyley, who was his her main chef, and he was going like this. <laughs> 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 but it was. But yeah, nothing was thrown away. <laughs> nothing was thrown away, yeah. and you know, those yeah. sweet parmesan biscuits all grilled. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, they went yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what, the last question, yeah, or comment. Last question. It's it's a reflection really of, I can remember, an example of her generosity. We used to have to make hot cross buns, for all the suppliers just before Easter, oh. and, and yeah. then we'd get sent off to go and deliver them to various places in the oh. town. Mm. And, and sort of, she was incredibly sustainable. Mm. She only used what was there yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing is that um, I'm here with two people I worked with when I worked there, mm. Rex and Carrie, <laughs> and we've continued our friendship Mm. since the early 1990s. Mm. So that was something that she also fostered. Oh, I'm that so was fantastic. I'm so glad that you, you raised that, because certainly that's my experience. My, some of my deepest friendships were started at the Carved Angel and continue to this day, and I know that's true for so many people. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring this to a close with a, a final, very short clip from, from Joyce. Um, it will become immediately apparent what it is, it needs no explanation. Um. Joyce, if you had to choose a desert island dish, what would it be, or a sort of meal? <laughs> I think probably um, just, perhaps just nice crispy roast duck uh, with applesauce and nice, nice vegetables. Just something quite simple, but um, it's really nice and crispy. And who would be with you at that meal? Oh, Stephen. So thank you everybody um, for being such a lovely audience and coming and celebrating and listening about this remarkable woman, Joyce Molyneux. And thank you to this wonderful, brilliant panel of in inspiring women chefs who are also leading the way and um, sort of holding the mantle that, that Joyce pulled. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So to, to Joyce Molyneux. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Joyce.